All right, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, it's just uh, past 11 o'clock. So thank you very much for uh, coming to this session uh, this morning. Uh, glad to see everyone here. Uh, go ahead and, uh, we'll go ahead and do introductions. So my name is Nihar Bihani. I'm a product manager at Amazon. Uh, I work on the Amazon CloudFront team, uh, which is our CDN service. Um, uh, hi, I'm uh, Dhruv Parpe. I'm a solutions architect, and I um, focus heavily on media services as well. And my name is Jeroen Weyering. I'm the co-founder and original developer of JW Player. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so just a quick uh, run through the agenda. Um, I'll talk for the first few minutes. What I'll go over is um, some of the... Uh, so, so the session is titled Secure Media Delivery. So we'll talk a lot about media delivery and the security components and security aspects of how you can deliver um, your content um, to end users with the right set of security aspects in place. So first I'll talk about when I, uh, when I talk to different customers, what I hear in terms of what their needs are for uh, security. And those needs are generally based on the type of content that they're delivering and the value of that content. Then I'll uh, uh, talk about uh, AWS and some of the AWS services and components that allow customers to make sure that those security components are in place. Um, then Jerome will talk about JW Player a little bit. Um, and then Drew will do a demo on, the, on, uh, on two different uh, types of uh, streams. We'll do a, a video on demand, a secure video on demand stream, and then also a secure live stream. Uh, we'll do a demo and explain how those things work and go over the architecture of how we've configured those. <coughs> so from a security perspective and, and you know, delivering your media to end users, you know, this is a busy chart, but what I really want you to take away from this is that there are different types of use cases and the type of security that you would want for your media content should be commensurate with the value of that content. So you don't necessarily need to put the highest levels of security on something like the nightly news, which will expire you know, or become stale very quickly. Or something like, you know, if you look at the first use case there, the public user-generated content. Right? Frequently, you'll find that, that it's just openly available for everyone to access. But on the other end of the spectrum, when you have premium content, uh, that you're monetizing, or if you have uh, pre-release content, such as first-run Hollywood movies, um, you know, something that you would want to protect uh, from getting leaked before it's supposed to go out, there you would want some of the highest levels of security. So you look at um, some of the media distributors putting things like encryption, um, watermarking, digital rights management, uh, and potentially other things to make sure that the content is as secure as possible. And then there's a whole spectrum in between, right? It just depends on what your use case is, who you're trying to deliver your content to, and how valuable is that content. This slide really, uh, I just wanted to put it up there because uh, just to get a level set on what are some of these different components when it comes to securing your media delivery, right? So there are several different options available. Uh, you know, there are things like token or signed URLs where, um, the, uh, the security components are actually in a policy statement in the URL itself, and only users that have a valid signed URL can access your content, and you can sign that URL based on where the user is coming from, um, or how long of a duration do you want that user to have access to that content. You have AES encryption, where you're actually encrypting the bits it's themselves, so even if a user can get uh, somehow access to a, a content that should be secure, they won't be able to view it without having the key. Uh, digital rights management, that's similar to AES encryption, but you can put some business logic in place there as well, such as uh, you know, uh, the user can have access only for a certain amount of time after they've viewed it the first time. Geo-blocking, this becomes important when you have um, different licensing rights for uh, viewers in different geolocations. So if you have licensing rights to deliver video only in the United States, then you can geo-block users that are coming from outside the United States. If you have traveled internationally and tried to access Netflix, for instance, you may have seen that, that you're not able to access. And then watermarking, um, 
that's another way to sort of uniquely identify, to, to put like a marker on the video itself. Uh, and you can have a unique marker for each of your partners or each customer so that if that video does get leaked out, then you know exactly you know, what the source of that was, uh, who had uh, access to the original video there. So I want to talk a little bit about the AWS services that you can use to um, not only deliver your video, but actually sort of manage your video or your media content end to end. So there's a lot more than just delivery, right? You, you ingest your content into AWS. Um, you process it. You store it. You process it. Uh, and then there's the delivery of uh, getting it to your end users. And AWS has multiple component services that you can use uh, and sort of build different workflows based on what your needs are. So we wouldn't go through all of those, but I, you know, we'll talk about a few services in detail. So we'll talk about Amazon CloudFront today, which is for delivering the content to the end users. Talk about Amazon Elastic Transcoder for transcoding your uh, media content. Talk about S3 for storage, and then EC2 when we talk about uh, live streaming, uh, how you can run media servers on EC2 um, and uh, you know, transcode your uh, live content and then deliver that to end users. So how can you put some of these services together on AWS? I wanted to start off with a simple architecture diagram, both for video on demand as well as live. So on the on demand side, you have a media file that you can upload to S3. Then you can send it through Amazon Elastic Transcoder to transcode that file into different formats, send it back to S3. So your transcoded file is now stored in S3. And this S3 bucket can uh, serve as a origin for uh, CloudFront distribution. So CloudFront can then cache this content and deliver it to end users that are spread globally around the world. From a security perspective, you can lock down the Amazon S3 bucket so only CloudFront can have access to that bucket. And then you can also uh, deploy things like uh, signed URLs or SSL for end users accessing your content via CloudFront. For live, you have uh, a device that's capturing the live video. Uh, you can uh, send that live stream into an Amazon EC2 instance uh, that's running a media server. That media server could be something like a Valsa media server or an Adobe media server. And then um, that EC2 instance, uh, that media server, becomes the origin for CloudFront again. So CloudFront will be pulling the live chunks, the live bits from EC2 and delivering it out to end users. One thing that I did want to uh, point out here is using a CDN such as CloudFront, even for live delivery, can be really beneficial because CloudFront will collapse multiple users' requests that are coming in for the same chunks of that live video and send fewer requests back to the EC2 instance, to your media server. Uh, so that can help uh, decrease the load on your EC2 instance while CloudFront is handling the scale. You can also set cache control headers on CloudFront for your TS files or for your M3U hit manifest file so that CloudFront can actually cache those files, maybe even for a second or two, so that if you all of a sudden have a million users coming to watch your live stream, CloudFront can cache that and then deliver it from its local cache. So uh, you know, for live, I mentioned that you can run things like Wowza or uh, Adobe Media Server on EC2. You could also run things like, or you could also work with some of our other marketplace partners, such as ByDRM, EasyDRM, or Express, Express Play, for some of the security components, um, uh, you know, in your live or on-demand workflow. So, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes diving deep on some of the services, uh, particularly CloudFront and uh, Elastic Transcoder. So, CloudFront is a content delivery service. We have 52 edge locations around the world. Uh, supports both on-demand as well as live streaming. Uh, and different formats, uh, HTTP as well as uh, RTMP for on-demand. Uh, from an HTTP perspective, you can do um, HDS, HLS, uh, and there's also native support for smooth streaming um, when you're using CloudFront for delivery. You can also, you know, as I explained, you can also set custom TTLs for um, different types of content, so for your uh, chunks versus the manifest file. CloudFront also has uh, TCP optimizations with the origin server, keeps persistent connections, scales up the, uh, the window size uh, just to optimize the, the network paths so that we can get the content uh, as quickly as possible from the origin and deliver it to, um, to the end users. Particularly important in a live streaming use case where you don't want any buffering or any delays. And then um, 
you can also configure CloudFront to support things like customization based on what devices the end users are using to access your media or download your media, uh, where they're located in terms of geolocation and so forth. From a security perspective, um, you can have your own SSL certificate with CloudFront. So you can use your own domain name even if you are delivering uh, content over SSL. Um, you can enforce HTTPS only delivery to end users with CloudFront, or you can also redirect HTTP to HTTPS to make sure that uh, your content is, is encrypted as it's going along the path. Um, S3 um, can be secured with what we call private content, uh, and, as, and a part of private content is origin access identities, where only CloudFront is allowed to have access to the S3 bucket that has your media files. So that the end user, you can see that X there, end users can directly go to S3 to download the, that file. You can also um, sign the URLs, as I described earlier, with CloudFront, so that the end user also needs to have a valid signed URL to download content from, uh, from, an, from a CloudFront Edge location. And then when EC2 is the origin, you can also have security groups around your EC2 instance, such that only CloudFront has access to your EC2 or a media server running on EC2. Uh, finally, uh, CloudFront does record access logs into Amazon S3, so you can get users' data about your, about your viewers uh, after they have downloaded content from, uh, from CloudFront. Talk a little bit about Elastic Transcoder. So the Amazon Elastic Transcoder service is, uh, is uh, for transcoding your media files from one format to another. It's a highly scalable and a cost-effective service. It's, it includes the cost of um, you know, some of the licensing for different codecs and things like that, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, it integrates with other AWS services, such as uh, S3, and you saw that in the architecture diagram, where you can store your, uh, you know, your media files in S3, use Elastic Transcoder to transcode it, and then uh, store the output, format, uh, the output again into uh, S3 buckets. The outputs uh, that are supported by Elastic Transcoder you know, some of the popular uh, output formats, such as MP4 with H.264 and AAC, when I talk to customers, you know, these are, this is typically how, uh, you know, sort of the industry standard, what customers are doing today. Also WebM with VP8 and Vorpis. And then uh, trans Elastic Transcoder also supports adaptive bitrate formats, such as HLS and smooth streaming. It can generate the HLS manifest file for you. You can also use Transcoder for audio-only transcoding. Um, both inputs as well as outputs. And then uh, it's a pretty feature-rich service. We've recently, you know, about a little over a year ago is when we launched the service. And it's uh, already a fairly feature-rich service, uh, service in that it supports captions, uh, visual watermarks, um, you know, clipping, and things like that. From a security perspective, the Transcoder service is coming soon with a number of uh, security features. Specifically, we're adding support for uh, Amazon S3 encryption at rest. The, Amazon, uh, the Elastic Transcoder service will also allow sending an encrypted media file, decrypting it, uh, transcoding it, and then encrypting the output. So that's coming soon as well. Uh, the AWS key management service that was announced yesterday, uh, Elastic Transcoder will integrate with that uh, in the near future to protect the keys that are used for the encryption and decryption. And then finally, um, the service will add support for uh, uh, HLS streams and encryption in that it'll, you'll be able to specify, uh, or it'll include the URIs for the key file in the manifest for your HLS uh, streams. So all of these features are coming soon. And we'll actually show you in the demo we do later today, uh, Drew will be able to show you the, uh, the manifest output and see what it looks like. Just a quick note also about the, uh, the MPAA security best practices. So when it comes to media and delivering media content uh, with AWS, uh, AWS has alignment with uh, the MPAA security best practices, and multiple services are covered, as you can see here, um, as well as multiple content types are covered. Um, there's a lot more you can read about this on our website. I just wanted to point this out, just so you're aware. And beyond just the MPA uh, best practices alignment, uh, AWS services also have numerous um, security certifications and compliance 
requirements that our various services meet. Um, you know, some of these are SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3 compliance requirements, ISO 27001, PCI compliance, FedRAMP in the public sector, the federal space. Um, again, you can read a lot more about this uh, on our security center, and a lot of this stuff is, uh, I, you know, already covered in some of the other sessions at the conference. And the last point I'd, I'd make when it comes to the AWS components that you can use for your media delivery uh, is I'd like to call out identity and access management. Because when it comes to securing your media content, um, you know, you can put all of the encryption and DRM and everything in place, but if unauthorized users can have access to your AWS resources, you know, that doesn't really help uh, because they can then still go and access your content. So identity and access management allows you to create IAM roles so that only authorized users are able to access your resources within AWS and also uh, only you know, take specific actions within AWS services. So IAM integrates with uh, Amazon S3, where you can set policies on specific objects or buckets. IAM uh, also integrates with CloudFront, where you can uh, set resource level permissions and so on. So at this point, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Jerome and talk a little bit about JW Player and just players in general and the importance of players when it comes to delivering, uh, delivering your video content to end users uh, you know, and, and sort of their first impression because the first thing that they're doing is interacting with the player. Uh, so Jerome, thank you. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking about uh, so uh, AWS is handling the back end and then at the front end, um, you need a video player. So a lot of people use uh, something like YouTube or Vimeo, but there you don't have control over branding and over what other types of content is available. Or you can build a video player yourself. Um, the third option would be to, to actually grab a, a white label video player like JW Player. So we offer for developers a very easy to use but very extensive package for playback of all kinds of content. Uh, we used to do that only on the internet in Flash and HTML5, but we're increasingly also uh, moving into areas like mobile, native, iOS and Android, and then also OTT platforms as uh, platforms like Chromecast and the Apple TV are popping up and we now see the, the new Fire TV boxes. So there's, there's definitely a lot of movement in that area. And, and typically, JW Player is, is offered as a replacement for the built-in component uh, on HTML5 that would be the video tag. And on something like Android, it's the Android Media Player. And there we offer a single set of APIs or a single set of functionalities across platforms that, that gives you consistent things for uh, user experience, adaptive streaming, uh, monetization through video advertising, uh, something we call casting. So you have an iPad, you can actually cast that video to your Apple TV or you have an Android device, you can cast that video to your, um, to your Chromecast. Um, we're really working on standardizing and extending that ecosystem. And, and then the last part is video analytics to really see, hey, how are your videos doing? And, and then for the purposes of this demo, we're, we're really looking at um, uh, content um, streaming to a web player. Um, there, you basically can see the JW player as a replacement of the video tag. And what we're then doing is kind of like smoothing out all the glitches or the, the lacks of, of supported components in, uh, in the browsers today. Um, a very good example is Internet Explorer 8. Um, no HTML5 support yet, but still 5% of the market is using it. Uh, the second component is what we, what we call a premium user interface. Uh, you want your videos to be as nice and as good looking as those on Netflix and Hulu. And, uh, but not necessarily spent the thousands of hours of engineering time to really polish that experience. And that's something that, that JW Player gives you. And then the third part, and this is something that, that, that is fairly unique to JW Player, is that the Apple HLS streaming protocol, the protocol that we're gonna use in the demo today, is actually played back by JW Player on desktop browsers. So what that means is that you can set up a workflow with one single protocol and stream it out to desktop and mobile devices. So that saves you a lot of the hassle of like two or three protocols to, to reach our platforms. Um, and not only do we like support that protocol 
at, at its baseline, but will also um, do things like uh, multiple audio tracks, um, so you can switch languages. Captioning are, is something that's, uh, that's uh, supported by JW Player. And uh, we put a lot of effort into fast, uh, making the video player start up fast, making the video appear on your screen fast. Every second that, that the video is not popping up, uh, you'll lose almost 10% of your audience. So it's very important that, that that video is fast and beautiful. So the other part of that is quality. If your video is very high quality, then your customers or your viewers will stick around longer. Then last, in terms of uh, security functionality, um, Jira Player supports tokening for all the major CDNs, including CloudFront. Um, there's not that much that, that we're doing as a client-side player. We're just making sure that in the scripting layer, we're not mangling the token URLs, for example, due, due to encoding or decoding. Um, Jira Player offers domain restriction. So if you have a video that is sitting on yourdomain.com, somebody grabs that video player and embeds it on his domain.com, you can actually block that down and make sure that that does not happen. Uh, the third part is the HLS encryption. So that's the standard where the, the, when somebody gets hold of your media files, they can actually do, not play it. They need the keys to play it. Uh, Geo player understands that mechanism and also can decode in the client up to HD quality content. And then the last part, um, well, this is not something that JRU Player supports today. Um, it's something that um, is like Im implemented in browsers um, in like the last couple of years. Other browsers are still working on it. Um, it's a standard called encrypted media extensions. Um, it allows for DRM. It allows basically for the, the widely used DRM platforms to be played back by the browsers themselves. Um, it's something that with JW Player we're in like sync step with those uh, with those platforms, and, and we really want to um, get all the browsers on there, so studio content can play in native HTML5. And as you can see, the market is um, two thirds there at this point. Uh, Chrome supports it, Safari supports it in the latest Yosemite release. Uh, Internet Explorer supports it in the, in the latest 11 release, and Firefox, um, it does not support EME yet, but uh, there is progress in this area. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Drew to uh, do the actual demos. All right, thank you so much, Sean. All right, so um, for the demo that we're gonna show today, what we're gonna do is really mainly focus on using um, uh, AWS services for the video on demand piece. Uh, so usually what you have is a whole host of different pieces that you have to look through. But for today's demo, uh, we're going to use S3 for storage. Uh, we're going to use Elastic Transcoder for the transcoding and the encryption as well. Uh, we're going to use uh, Amazon CloudFront for the actual delivery of the content to the end user. And um, in the overall platform, we're also going to be engaging uh, the key management service for the actual encryption piece for uh, Elastic Transcoder. And we'll discuss that in the architecture itself. Uh, we're going to use uh, JW Player for the playback of the actual uh, video. Uh, and really the benefit of all of this is that we want you to have the, avail the high availability, the scalability, and the low cost that we can offer you from using services rather than servers, right? Uh, if you have to imagine having a whole fleet of different transcoding servers, encryption servers, and a whole host of other things that you need to take care of, uh, with using just services, we can reduce that to just when you actually need to transcode and encrypt your data. Um, so let's really quickly, before we actually show the demo, talk about what that looks like um, if, from a transcoding piece, right? So you as the media owner uh, would first obviously upload your content into S3, right? Uh, this S3 bucket that you have uh, can be completely locked down to just you as the owner having access to it uh, and <clears throat> no one else. So that would be your unencrypted media file, right? Uh, at that point in time, what you can do is you can send a key file uh, to the key management service. Now, this key file will be encrypted, okay? And basically, we will use the key management service to encrypt the, the key file that will actually eventually encrypt your uh, video file, okay? Uh, the reason for this is really because um, protecting the key file is just as important as protecting the content, right? If we were to allow for that key file to be available at any point in time, the, the entire purpose of this is invalid at that point, right? So we want to encrypt it and have that stored in a secure location. So you'd have a master key file that would be in the key management service, 
which would then wrap your key file that's used for encryption uh, with another encrypted layer, right? So that's sent back to you in an encrypted form, right? Uh, you can then call Elastic Transcoder. You can send the encrypted key that was received by you uh, from um, the key management service to Elastic Transcoder. Elastic Transcoder would have a role. That role, or an IAM role, would allow for access to two things. The S3 bucket with the content, right? So this is a locked bucket that you have control over, and the key management service, right? So once you give access to Elastic Transcoder to access both these different pieces, uh, the uh, unencrypted key and the, the actual unencrypted video can be sent to Elastic Transcoder. Elastic Transcoder will handle the transcoding and the encryption, and then what you'll get is an encrypted file that will be stored in an S3 bucket for you. Okay? Uh, from that point, you can use a JW player or any uh, standard player to actually request for that content. Uh, that content will be delivered from uh, CloudFront. So at this point in time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move over to the demo itself. What we've done is we've actually pre-baked the video. We've pre-encrypted it. And we're going to show you this, uh, this in, in effect right now. So let's quickly log in. Okay. All right, so what we've got right now is basically um, the encrypted data stored in S3, right? Um, I'm going to quickly show you what the manifest output looks like. So once uh, Elastic Transcoder completes the, the conversion into TS segments, it will also generate the M3U8 manifest file, right? Uh, if you look through this, you will also see that there is a URI that you can define. You can define this URI to whatever you like, right? Um, and this would actually point to the key file that's being used. If you notice, there's also an initiation vector that's defined for different parts of the key file depending upon the TS file that's being called. All right, so this is all done for you and managed by Elastic Transcoder. Um, from a video perspective, what I've got right now is I've got a domain that's defined and pointed to CloudFront, uh, which is looking at the S3 bucket, which has the content. The content is protected uh, with OAI, or uh, origin access um, uh, controls. And basically, at that point in time, we can just load the stream. And what we should see is the video playing back. Now, if we look at the network elements, what you'll see is that at every call of the TS file, there's also a key file that's being called. Right? That's being used by the player to decrypt the content and to play it back on the screen. At this point, I'd like to call Jerome to maybe talk about a little bit more about the inner workings of JW Player and how that's uh, being handled under the hood. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what you can see here at the bottom is that actually the, the fragments of the video are being loaded as well as the key files. So every other fragment, or I don't know exactly what the interval is, every couple of fragments you're loading the key file, and then um, the player knows like, hey, I used this key to decrypt the fragments. Um, this one also nicely shows what it means uh, that, that a stream is adaptive. Uh, the videos are being loaded in small chunks. The video player glues them together, not only across the timeline, but also across different video qualities. So the video uh, end user always sees the highest quality content. Uh, you can see that here where uh, with JW player, you can actually see the uh, five bit rates of this video. Um, automatically, by default, the, geo, the player itself will switch up and down. You can choose to either select a low bit rate for yourself if you uh, want to free up your internal network, like your, your emails are not coming through, or you want to actually go to a higher quality and don't mind waiting for the content. And then if we go a little bit lower, we actually see the embed code of the JW player. There's two components to that. At the top, you'll see the library that's being loaded. And at the bottom, you'll see the chunk of JavaScript that's called to set up the video player instance. Uh, the library is something that you can, you can download from our site, put that on your own server, serve it up from your own server. Again, like with everything else, make sure that that is uh, deployed in a scalable way. So put your content on, put your data player instance on an S3 bucket, put the CloudFront on top of it so it always like, can manage large loads. Uh, you can also use what, what we call our cloud-hosted version of the player. Basically, that's our version of JW player that is hosted on S3 and served up through CloudFront. 
Uh, in terms of the embed code, a, a lot of it is fairly straightforward. You can set the dimensions of the video player, both like statically or uh, responsively. Um, you can set the mode of the video player if you want to prefer Flash versus HTML5 for platforms that play both. And then the last one, this one is, is an item to, uh, to, to take note of. It's, this is an option where you can say, hey, I really want to play HLS content on Android devices. Now on Android, for HLS, um, there is a, it's a bit of a gray area in, in, in terms of what platforms support it and what platforms do not support it. Uh, the older versions of Android, and then you're really looking at Gingerbread and, and lower, they do not support N, uh, HLS at all. Um, should you have uh, content that you want to deploy across all of Android, it's always good to set up a separate MP4 file, and then Jitter Player will use that one for your, um, for your older Androids. In this case, because our stream is encrypted and we only do HLS, um, that's not happening. So on Android Gingerbreads, this won't work. An ice cream sandwich and jelly bean, so then we're talking 4.0 through 4.3, and kind of the biggest chunk of the Android market. Um, HLS support is there, in encryption playback is there, um, but there's, there's quite a lot of loading and buffering in the Android framework. Um, what we're doing with this true is actually telling JW Player that, hey, if you're an ice cream sandwich, or if you're on Jelly Bean, I still want to play the HLS video on Android. So that way, you extend your device reach to Android, uh, to those Android 2 uh, versions. Um, luckily, the higher versions of Android, KitKat, and in particular Jelly Bean, have really good HLS support. So over time, this problem should go away. So you want to move on to the live yeah. demo? Thank you so much. Uh, actually, I've got a couple more slides to show uh, for that in the presentation itself before we move on to the live demo. Um, so at this point, this is basically what we showed you right now. We've actually already handled off this process and controlled it. Now, uh, like I said earlier, uh, if, if the key gets exposed, uh, it's potentially not as good as what it was before that, right? So you really want to look at protecting that key. So as a best practice, what we recommend is uh, once the playback is actually happening, you could look to actually have a couple of EC2 instances which would deliver the key to the end user. Now, if, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that uh, within the M3U8, you can define the URI that calls the key, right? So let's assume here that we've got an application. You've been able to log into it. Now, within Elastic Transcoder, you can define whichever URI you want. It doesn't have to directly point to the key. So this could actually point to an application that would then deliver the key to the end user. Okay, uh, so in this case, what we have right now is, uh, as an example, you could use DynamoDB to store the encrypted key value, the one that was re returned to you from Elastic Transcoder. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, from the key management server, right? Uh, once that's with you, you can actually put that into, say, a DynamoDB table, right? Uh, at that point, whenever a request comes for the file, for the key itself, uh, you could actually send a request from the EC2 instance to the key management service. Right? The key management service will hand back to you the unencrypted key. Now, obviously, you don't want to keep doing that all the time for every single request. So one of the recommendations we have is maybe you can think about hosting it in memory right, for a certain amount of time so you can deliver that as a, as a local cache as well. Right? Post that, you can just wipe it, and then you've got a secure location for that key itself. Okay. Uh, so a few best practices. Um, one of the things that we talked about was allowing only the CDN to access the source content. This is very, very important. You want to make sure that the host is not, ex um, the source is not exposed uh, to the entire internet, right? So control the source. You can use uh, S3 uh, bucket policies with CloudFront, right? And just make sure that only CloudFront has access to S3. Um, the other thing is that with VOD content, um, you can define a high TTL setting or a time to live setting for your content. Right? The, the content isn't changing. Uh, so you can actually just define a very high TTL. We'll cache it for more time so you can actually allow it to get cached at the edges. You get better service to your customers, and your origin uh, reduces in requests that are hitting it. If you have a requirement, you can geoblock your stream as well. Right? Uh, we spoke about that earlier. And another thing that you can think about doing is defining uh, your 400 and 500 error caching uh, TTLs, right? This is actually a setting that we have 
within CloudFront, one of the recommendations we have for video especially is to reduce that TTL to as low as you feel necessary. The reason for this is, let's say that there's an edge case where uh, you have a CMS that has published the content, but the content isn't actually available for uh, consumption. Uh, this has more to do with live than, than with uh, VOD, but it still applies here. Um, you can actually get a, a 404 at that point in time. If you see a 404, um, what would happen with the CDN standard uh, uh, is basically it would cache that 404, right? So if we define a lower TTL for the, uh, the error, you would then be able to pull the file much faster. And I'll actually be able to show that to you in the uh, live streaming demo. In fact, let's move on to that right now. So for the live streaming demo, like Nihar mentioned earlier, there are multiple options for sending your RTMP stream into Amazon Web Services and then delivering that out. But for this particular demo, what I decided to do was use pure open source uh, software. Right? So what we're running is an EC2 instance running Nginx with a plugin called Nginx RTMP module. Now, it sounds like it's only going to be working in RTMP, but this particular module actually supports output in both HLS as well as Dash, and of course, RTMP, right? Uh, we're going to transcode using FFmpeg, okay, which is another open source tool. Um, again, FFmpeg was compiled with the RTMP module as well for FFmpeg. Uh, if you need more information about the particular plugin that we're using for uh, Nginx, uh, that last GitHub repository is actually the repository that it was used from. Okay, so let's look at the setup itself before we actually show the demo. Um, so what we're going to do is we have an RTMP stream, right? Uh, we can use uh, Route 53's failover DNS um, to send the, the data to the uh, instance that's being used at that point in time. The reason I chose to use failover DNS for this particular setup uh, is because since Nginx is also handling the encryption and the key management itself, um, if you actually sent it to two different instances, you could potentially have different keys and basically playback would fail at that point in time. So we want to send it to one instance, but we want to have a failover of some sort. So if there is an issue with the instance, uh, Route 53 would start uh, sending data to the other instance itself, and you can continue your stream from there. Uh, from that point on, you can call your client, whichever that might be, in this case, we're going to use JW Player. And um, from the output itself, we're going to send it from CloudFront. So I'll stop there. I'll switch over. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to use my phone as the RTMP stream. And I'm going to stream you guys. Um, so you can wave at me for a second. Let's switch over. OK. All right, so it's going to take a couple of seconds to actually publish. But I am publishing right now. Um, and what I'm going to do is. I'll show you what happens basically before it starts. Is you, if you look right now, you see that there's a 404. Now, if I hadn't defined that setting of a low TTL, what would happen is this would stay on screen for five minutes, because that's the default uh, caching mechanism for a 404 error. It'll stay for five minutes. But what I've defined is a much lower TTL. So now you see that it should start streaming. And there you go. We're actually streaming the room right now. So this is using complete open source components. And basically, my phone is the broadcaster. Now, this could be anything you want it to be. This could be um, uh, an open broadcasting system. This could be a, a professional broadcasting system. It could be your transcoder itself on premises. Whatever you want to use, you can use for this. And uh, just to show you that it's actually using keys, if we can pull up the network. There you go. So if you see, there is um, a demo key that's being pulled regularly. Now, what I'm doing with this is I'm actually rotating the keys, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. So we basically have a completely open source platform that you have available to you that you can use to stream um, um, any, any live event you want. So I just stopped the stream, so it might start stopping right now. So I'm going to switch back and uh, talk about a best practice as well for this as well. <clears throat> so once the stream actually hits your um, your player, uh, before that, hopefully, we're looking at having an application that's wrapping that around. So you have some way of authenticating your users. This is an extremely important piece. Uh, you don't want to just have a URL <clears throat> that points to your, um, uh, to your stream. You want to have some layer of authentication, some way of getting a cookie so you can actually define who gets access to your M3U8 files, right? Or to your video files, I should say. Um, so 
it's very important to have an application that makes sure you're handling authentication properly. So this would be an overall setup. This would be for both um, the VOD as well as the live stream itself. Uh, from a best practices perspective, um, you want to limit access to port 1935 to only trusted sources. So what is port 1935? Port 1935 is the default port for our TMP streams. Okay? Uh, if you have a, another port that you're using, again, restrict access to that to the EC2 instance. Right? Only allow uh, the trusted source to have access to the EC2 instance at that point in time. Um, define your TTL settings for your TS files and your M3 U8 files. So in this particular case, we don't want to have extremely long uh, TTLs. And the reason for that is that the M3 U8 never closes. It's constantly being updated. That's how HLS works. So you want to define a very short TTL for M3 U8s, and if you want a fairly long one for TS files. If you need to, you can geoblock your stream. Um, again, you want to define that 400 and 500 error, as you saw before. If you, if you allow it to just be a default, it'll take five minutes before it actually starts playing back your video. So if you have a live stream and it's coming up, you want to make sure that you keep that very low. Uh, randomize the TS file name. So uh, this is really, really useful when you have um, uh, an, an open stream, which means that it's not being encrypted, right? So if you had um, uh, an open stream and it was just basically following a standard pattern of the next file getting the next number, what could potentially happen is people could just basically make their own manifest files, right? If you understand a pattern, you can generate your own M3U8 and then your stream is leaking. You don't want that. So you want to have just a random name showing up for your file name. Okay? Um, and the other thing is you want to rotate the key file as often as possible. This is very, very important with live um, because if the key does get exposed at whatever point, it doesn't matter. It's just for two segments or three segments or whatever you define it for. It's the, the key file is only used as, uh, for as many files as you want it to be used for, and you can define that within the configuration. So as I said earlier, this would be what a typical security group would look like. You'd want to have HTTP and HTTPS open to the world. But for your uh, RTMP stream, you want to define it and lock it down as much as possible so that only uh, the, um, the RTMP source has access to it. Uh, this is a little bit small, but if you notice over here, we have defined a, a minimum TTL. This is actually the CloudFront console. We've defined a minimum TTL for the M3U8 to be extremely low. Right? So it's at two seconds, uh, and you can define this to whatever you want, depending upon what your use case is. <clears throat> uh, from a geo-restrictions perspective, this is again our console. Uh, you can then define which countries you want to have access to the content. It's all in our console and available on our API and SDK. <clears throat> For the, the uh, error pages and the response codes you provide, uh, again, over here you see I defined 403, 404, and 500s to have a very, very low TTL. And this is, again, just to adjust to the point that we mentioned earlier. Um, from an Nginx RTMP HLS configuration, um, I'm not going to go through the entire Nginx configuration that we have, but just a few specific points. Uh, the number one is, obviously, we want to turn on encryption. It's literally HLS underscore keys on. Um, the next one is the, the thing I mentioned about uh, changing the uh, naming convention. right? So I used a timestamp. And I rotated that at 250 milliseconds, right? So it actually multiplied with the timestamp to provide a random name. Um, for your key path, you can define whichever key you'd like. Um, uh, oh, sorry, whichever path you'd like. Um, and then you can, again, define your uh, URL or the URI for your keys that would be generated into your manifest. So it's literally HLS underscore key underscore URL. And then you define the URI within that. Um, the, the rotation of the, the key file itself, that's defined by HLS fragments per key. Right? So in my use case, I basically used uh, uh, a key file for two fragments. Right? So you can have it for five fragments, for 10 fragments, whatever you'd like. A fragment is basically a TS file. Okay? Uh, and then if you have a use case where you don't need encryption and you want to have a highly available setup, what you could potentially do is use HLS fragment slicing aligned. This is, again, a setting, which basically means that it will look at the RTMP stream's timestamp, okay, and then slice it at exactly the points where it needs to be sliced. So you could actually transcode on two servers at the same time and ensure that the output is exactly the same. Okay? 
And then, of course, you'd want to have a cleanup, and basically after that, you're done. Okay? Um, and that's all we have right now. Um, so thank you so much for showing up. And if you have any questions, we'll be out the back. So thank you.